Welcome to the Smoke Pit. If you're new to the channel or to these Smoke Pit episodes, I encourage you to watch the introduction video I have linked here and in the description section of this video. This introduction may answer any questions you might have about these episodes and the stories in them. Now, I will always welcome any and all skepticism, and I understand that many, if not all, of these stories might seem unbelievable. I see no problem with that. If you feel inclined to offer your opinion, I just ask that you be respectful. Now, on to the stories. This smoke bed episode will specifically address those stories shared in response to the Strange Lights Over Kentucky episodes. And by that, I mean specifically those personal encounters that your fellow viewers have had with strange objects in the sky. Far from sighting rare cryptids and other paranormal entities, unidentified flying objects of various shapes, sizes, colors, and strange behaviors do appear to be a much more common thing to see, no matter where you might live in the world. It might be a coincidence, or perhaps not, but many of these stories that were shared independently of one another seem to be similar. For example, three individuals living in North America, Lethal Venom, Edmonton Rails, and Montesquieu, all appear to have each seen a similar phenomenon, a formation of strange red and white lights flying at low altitude. The first event took place in 1977, as Montesquieu writes. I lived about 15 minutes away from Fort Knox, Kentucky. I was a teenager in the summer of 1977. It had just become dark when I witnessed three glowing red spheres flying slowly in a triangular formation. It's hard to tell the altitude, perhaps a thousand feet, as they traveled almost directly overhead. They were eerily quiet as they maintained a perfect triangular pattern and headed in the direction of the base. Never seen anything like that again. Well, he might not have seen anything like that again, but some years later, and about a thousand miles to the northeast, a similar phenomenon was seen over central Maine. Lethal Venom writes, While growing up in central Maine, I've seen a few weird things in this location. The most memorable one was when I was a teenager at the house I grew up in. I was looking out the window into the backyard, which extends into a large field that is a few hundred feet long. Way off into the distance, at the end of the field, above the tree line, I saw a light, which at the time didn't seem too weird until it slowly got closer. I mentioned something to my dad and brother, and we went outside to get a closer look. The object continued to move closer and eventually over the house. It was not at the height of regular aircraft. It was much lower and had three very distinct lights in a triangular shape. It also made no sound as it was completely silent. Not long after this, I was at a friend's house who was taking flying lessons. He's now a pilot of Southwest Airlines all these years later. And he had out one of his flight maps which showed airports and places you could and could not fly. The entire central area of Maine is all restricted commercial aircraft space, which would also explain why I never saw commercial planes flying directly overhead growing up as a kid. And it gave more weight to the idea that whatever it was that I saw that night, the three lights in a triangular shape, it was likely not a commercial aircraft. We do have one Air Force Base in the state, Loring Air Force Base, but it has been closed for a long time as far as military use. And yet again, after this observation in Maine, some years later, about 2,000 miles to the northwest, and only a few years ago from today, a similar phenomenon was seen again over the city of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. Edmonton Rails writes, Back around 2015 or 16, I was out in the pasture of my family's farm. It was around 3 to 4 a.m. on a summer night, and I was watching the night sky. I noticed what appeared to be a bright white dot in the center of three other dots that formed a triangle. At first I thought they were all stars, but then the center dot began to move. It moved upwards and slowly turned from white to red before moving high enough to disappear. It looked like it could have been a flare, but what kind of flare originates stationary at thousands of feet in the sky before moving? 
The kicker is on that night I had a DSLR camera with me that would have been fully capable of getting a good photo and even a video of this object. However, I was still learning how to use it that night. Evidently, whatever these triangular formations of lights or objects were, other formations of lights or objects having precise geometric shapes have been witnessed, as indicated in the next two accounts. Osaka Rose writes, When I was in high school, I was laying out on top of the picnic table in the backyard one sultry summer night. I had been catching fireflies in a pickle jar with my brother. It was a moonless night, and in those days, this was the 60s, no one had security lights. Only a few porch lights turned on in the neighborhood, so it was pretty dark outside, especially in our backyard. I was looking at the stars when I noticed that a group of them were moving. I kept thinking I was mistaken, but nope, they were moving. The stars were in a large diamond formation and glowed a yellow color. I told my brother, look, the stars are moving up there. He looked right pointed, but then said, yeah, it's just a plane. But it wasn't. It had 12 distinct lights in a diamond pattern. I kept watching as it traversed the night sky, and then just vanished. That's when I knew UFOs were real. I've only had one other experience sighting a UFO. As Rose indicated, seeing is often believing. And a gentleman who goes by RRXX and lives outside the U.S. writes about a distinctly different shape that he witnessed. When I was 15 or 16 years old, I saw a thing hanging in the air, which was the shape of a hexagon. I'm sure I wasn't being delusional. I remember very well what I saw. I feel there is absolutely a type of technology being kept from us. This gentleman makes an interesting point because it is not at all a conspiracy theory to say that there is technology being kept from the general public. I certainly wouldn't expect the average person to have access to information about, say, nuclear devices. But if some UFOs are the result of some kind of advanced technology, I couldn't blame anyone for being curious about it, especially after seeing it. And speaking of such unusual technology, others have shared stories about witnessing strange military aircraft. As a quick recap, in the Strange Lights Over Kentucky episode, Robert noted that despite the diamond-shaped UFO he witnessed having the ability to hover in a stationary position over the ground and to move through the air at incredible speeds, it remained completely and eerily silent, absent of any sounds of propulsion or mechanical noise. And although the various aircraft in these next accounts do not resemble Robert's observations of a diamond-shaped aircraft, they do have two things in common. All of these aircraft were witnessed flying in the vicinity of Fort Campbell, and despite being in mid-flight, all of these aircraft are said to have been completely silent. Idevsi writes, I was never in the military, I'm still in high school, but before they kicked us out so they could build a housing development on the land, I used to live in a trailer park near Sabre Army Airfield, which is on the south side of Fort Campbell. While I was living there, I saw a lot of paranormal stuff, like dark figures in the woods. But there was one instance where my mother and I saw something that defies explanation. One night, off in the trees near our home, we watched as a strange aircraft landed in the woods. It looked like an F-15, but it was devoid of any external lights. It was completely blacked out. It was close enough that we could hear the noise of the trees around it, as if there was some kind of engine exhaust that was moving them. But there was no noise from the aircraft itself. As a side note to his story, there are fixed-wing aircraft, jets, like the Harrier and F-35, that can hover as well as conduct vertical takeoffs and landings. But in all of my experience, these aircraft are extremely noisy. Whatever that strange aircraft was, it would have to be something else entirely. And if silent floating geometric shapes and fixed-wing aircraft weren't puzzling enough, Retro Vertigo is an Army veteran who shared a similarly strange account, this one involving rotary-wing aircraft, or helicopters. He writes, I was with the 101st Airborne Division, 2nd Battalion, 506th Infantry Regiment on Fort Campbell. 
Creepiest thing I might have ever seen was one evening, while I was walking near the airfield just after dark. All of a sudden, two completely blacked out helicopters flew about 500 feet directly overhead of me. The thing is, except for the noise from the rotor wash, just the sound of the wind, I mean, these helicopters were completely silent. They didn't make a sound. Imagine a fan with no motor noise. None. I was well acquainted with helicopters in all conditions at this point. It's still weird to think about. The Smoke Pit will be right back after these messages. And now, back to the stories. Although we can only speculate on the nature of practically all of these sorts of strange, unidentifiable craft, these two accounts and other UFO sightings which occur in the vicinity of military installations at least seem to indicate that, as opposed to the idea of extraterrestrial visitations, these UFO sightings could be explained by some kind of military experimentation or other undisclosed activity. As with the weather balloons that were said to be involved in the confusing Mantell UFO incident in 1948, regardless of whether the objects seen were balloons, those weather balloons were also a highly classified technology at that time, and few among the thousands of military personnel in the region were aware of their existence. The U.S. Classification System for Sensitive Information has a concept called Need to Know. In other words, just because an individual is qualified to access classified information, he or she is only provided limited amounts of information on a strict need-to-know basis. I suppose it's the same idea as not putting all of your eggs in one basket. So whether it's advanced encryption technology for our communication devices or experimental aircraft, advanced technology is certainly something that any enemy would want to know about. So along with a plethora of other things, if the military is involved with these unidentified objects, it's probably one possible explanation as to why they have remained such a mystery. And as with Mantell's incident, reports of UFOs witnessed by or in conjunction with military aircraft can date back quite a ways, such as the Foo Fighter UFOs reported during World War II. The following account also took place during that war. A UK viewer by the username of Lazosh Custom writes, My father saw something here in the UK during World War II whilst a dogfight was happening above him. This was sometime 1940-1941. Not sure of the exact year or date as he was either five or six years old at the time, but he will never forget what he saw. It was a dark colored egg timer shaped object just sat stationary within the dogfight as planes were maneuvering around it, almost unaware of it. It gently wobbled side to side, then disappeared. My dad is a realist, no fool, and though he was very young, it stuck with him all his life. He's now 86 years old, but still, he remembers it. As for the next observation, this one by another Army veteran, his would take place in the state of Colorado. The Ride TV writes, I was at Fort Campbell and Fort Carson, with the weirdest thing I've seen being at Fort Carson. Fort Carson is on the south end of the city of Colorado Springs, and only about seven miles to the northeast on the east side of the city is Peterson Space Force Base, previously Peterson Air Force Base. This base is also home to NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. On the opposite side of the city, built up into the side of the mountains, is the Cheyenne Mountain Complex, which serves as NORAD's command and control center. And he says, what I saw was a gunmetal gray egg-shaped craft just hovering over NORAD. It made no noise and was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So, what might those egg-shaped dark-colored objects have been? Something that appeared at least twice in the last 80 years, I couldn't even begin to say. But Lazosha's father's story from World War II is not the only one that was submitted with regard to UFOs being spotted in proximity to flying aircraft. A viewer with the very appropriate handle, I Come in Peace, 
share the following observation. I live in Ontario, Canada. A couple of summers back, mid-August to be exact, I was just sitting in my backyard enjoying a cool drink on account of it was a hot day. I just happened to look up in the sky over the roof of my house and spotted an airliner flying over nearby Lake Ontario. Now, Pearson International Airport is about 25 minutes away. No biggie, right? I see airplanes all the time. But then I spotted another smaller craft. I thought it was a plane, and it was flying above the initial jet and flying in the same path of trajectory. Again, I thought nothing of it. But then, as I was gazing up at the two aircraft, I noticed that the bigger plane continued on its eastern course, but the smaller craft above the bigger craft appeared to stop in mid-flight and then shoot straight up in the air until it got smaller and smaller and it seemed to just climb off into space until it disappeared entirely. Strangest thing I've ever witnessed. Strange indeed but possibly not so unique of an experience. Shortly before, or possibly just after, the end of the Vietnam War in the mid-70s, a fellow viewer named John Reddick was a teenager in high school, standing outside of his house one evening. He writes, I was outside talking with some neighbors when I heard the very loud approach of a flight of Huey helicopters. It was so loud that we had to stop talking. They were heading to Camp Roberts in northern San Luis Obispo County in California. As the flight of the five Hueys passed over, myself and the others saw a dark red light following the last Huey in formation, about 50 or so yards behind the choppers. This light then came to a sudden stop, and as it did, a bright neon green beam of light shot out surprising all of us as we remarked, you know, what the hell, all at the same time. And for some reason, everyone asked me if I knew what it was. So I went and got my flashlight, and I began aiming it at the red light. I went left, right, then up, and down. And damned if it didn't match the movement of the flashlight. And one of the girls grabbed my arm and started to cry, and said, don't do that again. And at that same moment, the dark red light shot off straight up, and into space. I thought about telling my dad since he was retired Marine Corps, but well, then I thought to myself, eh, just keep quiet. Dad's gone now, and now I live in Nevada, some 400 miles north of Area 51. Yeah, weird stuff central, and it keeps getting weirder. Speaking of living in close proximity to military bases like John did in the 70s, as much exciting things that take place on these installations, living near to one can be a unique experience in many regards. Witnessing UFOs and these sorts of strange phenomena probably lies on the extreme end of the spectrum, with the more mundane experiences being things like having various aircraft flying over your house at all hours, or perhaps having your dishes rattling in the cupboard as the artillery units routinely practice firing their howitzers. For new buyers looking to purchase a home near these military bases, real estate agents most definitely know when these artillery units are on the firing range and will probably show you the house in between range days. Some of our friends had a nasty awakening in the middle of the night after moving into their new home, wondering why their house was suddenly shaking. The house was situated right against the backside of Camp Pendleton, which happened to be the artillery impact area. Still half asleep and now startled, the husband said his immediate dumb thought was that the house was possessed before he ran outside and realized that it was just the booming sound of freedom that he was hearing. When he called his real estate agent the next day to ask about it, she seemed to be unaware of this unique feature of the house. But as far as strange sightings go, when units are conducting live fire training at night on these rifle and artillery ranges, they will often deploy high-altitude flares to provide illumination. These amber-colored flares burn very brightly, can be seen from many miles away, and will appear to hover in the air before disappearing because they are attached to small parachutes that slow their descent until they burn out. There are any number of stories about people seeing these illumination flares hanging in the sky and reporting them as UFOs, with one such incident happening in Hawaii recently. But clearly, while flares are obviously not UFOs, as many of these other stories will tell us, 
it doesn't seem reasonable to say that everything that looks like a flare has to be a flare. Ricardo Aguirre writes, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and live near Fort Bliss. A few years ago, me and my dad were on our way to Pizza Hut on a Friday night, and we saw amber-colored lights hovering over the base. And one by one, they turned off. It was reported on the news the next day, but no explanation was given. At first, I thought it must have been military aircraft, but I've never seen any with amber lights. If it was something classified, why were they within sight of a residential neighborhood? CL-75 shared a similar experience. A few nights after 9-11, 2001, when all aircraft were grounded, I was at work. It was around 10 or 11 p.m., I'd say, and I was looking out at the horizon where there were about 8 to 10 sets of what I'd call headlights, of helicopters, or planes maybe. They were hovering there for a while, and to this day, I still have no idea exactly what was going on. I checked the newspaper for that area the next few days and found nothing about it. I asked around and no one else had seen it besides me and a co-worker. This was in Kentucky, about 20 miles south of Cincinnati. Now, I did check the satellite imagery for that area of Kentucky after reading his story, and there is technically an Army National Guard base in that 20-mile radius from Cincinnati. It's in a town called Walton. But as far as I can tell, the base is very, very small and is comprised of just a single building and a vehicle storage lot. I didn't see anything adjacent to it that looked like a firing range where flares would be expected to have been used. So, even if they were flares, why they were shot into the sky at all, and why so many of them, remains a question. Perhaps a memorial for the recent tragedy of 9-11? Terry Boone likewise lives in Kentucky and shared the following. One night, I was coming home from town heading north. As I was driving down the road, I noticed three orange-colored lights in the sky. At first, I thought they were stars, but as I drove, I could tell that they were closer to the ground and bigger than any star. Then one of them kind of flickered out slowly, followed by the next one, and then finally the last one went out. I know they were not flares, because they were too big and weren't moving. There was another witness to this that ran an ad in the paper asking if anyone else had seen them, but I didn't reply. For these three observations, based on what was described, my experience would tell me that they were flares, and some of them can look pretty big, but I wasn't there. So I can't say for certain that what they saw were flares. As it is, many UFO sightings do seem to be a light of some sort seen at a distance, either moving or hanging stationary in the sky. Flares are at least one possibility, especially when seen in close proximity to a military base with firing ranges. But then there are stories like these next ones that are far more difficult to explain. The Smoke Pit will be right back after these messages. And now, back to the stories. The Nightingale writes, When I was about 12 to 14 years old, I was living in an apartment in Kentucky, and we had these big sliding doors that go out to the deck. I used to always love looking out there because you could see the stars clearly at night. And one night, as I was looking outside, I saw something. I wasn't sure what it was at first. It just looked like a bunch of blinking lights in the sky, all clustered together. But then I looked closer at it, and I saw a round shape. So I said to my parents, you know, hey, come over here, look at this. You know, what is that? They didn't know what to make of it either. I stared at it for a little while longer, and then I was like, okay, it's probably just a plane or something. So I walked away for a little while. But when I came back, it was still there. And I was like, okay, so not a plane. So what then? I stared at it for about another 30 minutes, and then... Eventually, it just rose up into the sky and disappeared. I have no idea what I just saw that day, but it was certainly something. Well, as for the flare theory, I've never known them to burn for that long, nor do they blink or suddenly drift upwards like that. Another viewer, Philip or Philly Cheesesteak, seems to have seen something similar in the winter sky observing some kind of strange flashing lights in the clouds, which were likewise difficult to offer any speculation for what they might have been. 
Garrett Keenan submitted the next account, which seems to offer something far more mysterious by way of stationary flashing lights that disappear while they are being observed. Except, rather than appearing only once, the lights he saw returned on more than one occasion. He writes, My family has a long history of military service, and as for my story, it all started one gray, cold, seemingly normal night in March of 2011 in my last year of boarding school. The time of the event was precisely 9.39 p.m., and I was alone in my quarters with my roommate being out. Our living quarters were built on a large hill, which overlooks the countless salt marshes in the area. However, past the salt marshes, there are more hills and forest, which coincidentally houses Otis Air Force Base, now known as Joint Base Cape Cod. I happened to look out of my dorm room window and noticed a very bright, singular white object hovering just beyond the hills adjoining Otis Air Force Base. I was having trouble sleeping that night due to some personal issues, so I didn't think much of it. But after another sleepless hour and a half had passed, I caught another glimpse of it. I should mention that although I've never served, I would say that I am comfortably familiar with all sorts of military aircraft but this was nothing like one, because it made no sound. But as I watched it, it began to pulsate rapidly while remaining stationary in its position over the hills. My roommate had returned by that point, and so I grabbed him to come look at this thing. With our faces pressed almost comically against the window, we watched this thing pulsate like a police siren. Out of the corner of my eye, another one appeared to the west and began to pulsate, almost in unison with the first light. Then, both lights just disappeared into the night. We might have forgotten about it, but these things showed up again the next week. In fact, this whole thing reoccurred for almost a month, every Wednesday night at the same time, 9.39 p.m. to 11 p.m. The last night we saw it, however, we saw this thing, or light, or whatever it was, shoot past our school at lightning speed. Then, without a sound, it stopped abruptly, before rocketing straight up into the sky. Never saw it again after that. There were quite a number of stories shared, and you've all been so generous that I couldn't fit them all into a single episode. So stay tuned for the next Smoke Pit installment to cover more UFO encounters. In closing, because even I would consider myself a skeptic, the stories that Robert and certainly these many other veterans and individuals have shared will possibly be met with disbelief. In the responses to Robert's stories, I have seen more than enough reasonable skepticism of his encounters, let alone outright and completely pointless insults, especially those making bold assumptions about why he wouldn't have reported his strange encounters to his military command if they were true. I can imagine it would be difficult to understand why these events go unreported, especially to someone who has neither witnessed such strange things, nor served in the military or a similar occupation, like the police. But along this vein of thought, I just wanted to share this final comment, which I thought would answer that question. A user by the name of Nani Nani writes, My father joined the U.S. Army Air Corps way back when. Then, when it split into two branches, the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army, he went with the Air Force. He went to officer candidate school, then flight school, and flew fighters until transitioning to cargo during the Vietnam War. He retired as an 05 with 26 years. When I asked him if he had ever disclosed that he had seen any UFOs, after my own sighting not too long before, he told me, it's an unwritten rule. Pilots who wish to remain on flight status and continue flying do not report seeing UFOs. I nodded and left it at that. Personally, I think that comment speaks for itself. Keep your eyes on the skies, my friends. Keep your eyes on the skies. Speaking of UFOs and aliens, if you're looking for some additional entertainment, and if you enjoyed the Kitsune episode here on the channel, I suppose I do have something to share with you. A Marine Corps buddy of mine, Trip, is a combat veteran and something of a smoke pit storyteller himself. Rather incredible one, at that. I actually met him in a literal smoke pit in Okinawa. 
Fair warning, if you do check it out, his writing is much more colorful than mine, as he uses a special language called Marine Corps English. He's published a series of books titled appropriately as Smoke Pit Fairy Tales. They're fictional stories which, like the Kitsune episode, combine actual war events along with supernatural elements into a series that, well here I'll just read some of the reviews he's gotten so far. This is the first book I've actually read in 10 years. I could not put it down. I've never served in the military, but this was the wildest, realest book I've ever read, even with the aliens. One of the best books I've read. Even as a writer myself, there are really no words to describe how incredible this novel is, and I don't usually read war fiction or even science fiction. Just like the stories you hear in the smoke pit. If this series hasn't offended you yet, keep reading. No one is safe. If the movies Alien Nation and Hurt Locker had a threesome with blazing saddles, you'd end up with something like this book. This author drives home the reality of war and the casualties that come with it, both physically and mentally, and without skipping a beat in his transition to literal, otherworldly encounters. The most American thing since landing on the moon. Not buying this book is basically like burning the American flag. Tripp knew what he was doing when making this first book free. Now I know how a crack addict feels. And on that note, you can still read his first book for free on his website, smokepitfairytales.com, which is linked here and in the description section of this video. I'm only promoting his work and I do not benefit from it. I just want to see my fellow creators succeed at what they do best. So I thank you on his behalf for checking out his work. A special thank you again to my own patrons and YouTube channel members. You guys are extra awesome. I could not do this without your support.